Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to meet together from all across the globe. It's, it's an amazing thing. We don't take it for granted. We, we really see that this is a deep, deep blessing, forming uh, friendships, forming those special relationships in, in the family of God uh, as brothers and sisters who have the same father. What a privilege. What a privilege to be called children of God and to belong in a big, huge family. Mm. Father, we thank you for one another. We thank you that um, we can come with our questions to Ken and have them answered and all grow together in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Saviour the one who has redeemed us, who has, who has absolutely plucked us out of darkness mm. and translated us into the kingdom of God. So, Father, we commit this meeting to you today and thank you in advance for all that you have in store for each and every one of us. Yeah. Amen. 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 Thanks, Ross. And uh, let me just say again, just what a thrill it is to, uh, to be connected with you all. Um, as Ross said, you know, we don't take it for granted. We don't. We, we're quite humbled uh, to see what God is doing. It's, we know it's God. It's not us. It's God. And um, we're just excited to be a part of it. And, um, you know, I, 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 I come to this whole um, meeting in a, in a sense of real weakness. And uh, today, I mean, I'm just thinking, oh, Lord, <laughs> this is overwhelming to, to think that I can share with people from around the world. But, you know, who is sufficient for these things? Our sufficiency is of God. Mm. God, If God calls us to do something, he will equip us. But I, I know that without him, I, I certainly could not do that. And um, so I just thank you for joining us and for taking the time. I know it's a different time for you all around the world. Um, also, you know, we, we are facing some incredible times and we've had one or two questions about COVID vaccine and, uh, you know, the, the crisis that we're facing worldwide. What an incredible time we're living in. Mm. It's just like unprecedented. I know that word's been overused, but it is unprecedented. And uh, where is God in all this? What is God saying? That's what we're going to look at. Uh, during this time as well. What does the grace of God have to say about these times? Um, so some very good questions today, and I thank you all for sharing. And uh, we just look to the Holy Spirit to give us all wisdom. Let me just remind you that you can comment uh, on chat. I'm going to mute you all as we go into the question time. But you can comment on chat if you'd like to... Uh, uh, you know, raise a point or make a comment, even ask a question, you can do so on the chat um, facility there. Just write it briefly if you would. And uh, we'll see whether we can address any of those comments at the end. See how we go for time. We don't want to keep you too long, but at the same time, we do want to utilize this time the best that we can because you've taken the trouble to be with us. So, Let's get straight into the questions. Then I'm going to um, mute you all. And uh, I think that should do it. Okay. That's it. Okay. So what we're going to do then, I just um, bring up the, the uh, screen. There we go. Okay. Can you see the screen, David and Moses? Is it up there? PowerPoint? Okay. Well, here we go. Um, this is Grace Question and Answers number two. And uh, for those of you that missed the first one, by the way, you can get it on YouTube. We uploaded it and um, it's available on YouTube. So here's the second session we're heading into now. Uh, the first one is a question. Can you talk about the following scripture, please? For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And then the comment is made, I thought death here was equal to hell. I'd like to hear your view on this. So in other words, what it's saying is 
is this saying to Christians <clears throat> that if we are carnally minded, then we can end up in hell, or we can we can lose our salvation. Now, first of all, this is not an exhortation to Christians not to be carnally minded. That's not what this is saying. Okay, it is a statement to those who are in the flesh. Or sorry, it is a statement concerning those who are in the flesh. That is those who are in Adam and also those who are in the spirit. That is those who are in Christ. So to be carnally minded is referring to those who are in Adam, those who are in the flesh. They have the mind of Adam. They have the, uh, a natural mind, not a spiritual mind. But those who are in Christ are now spiritually minded. They mind the things of God. They mind the things of the spirit. So those who are in the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. And those who are uh, not, uh, sorry, sorry, and, and are on a course which leads to death. But those who are in the spirit, that is in Christ, experience Christ's life and his peace. Okay. So that's what that's, this is saying. It's not saying if you all of a sudden become carnal, you will end up going to hell. <laughs> it's not saying that at all. It's just saying those who are in the flesh, those who are carnally minded, uh, well, yeah, that's the ones that are setting their minds on the things of the flesh. They wouldn't dream of opening up their Bible each morning to read the word of God. They wouldn't dream of praying and having an intimate relationship with God. They wouldn't think about witnessing and sharing the gospel. They wouldn't lift their hearts and voices in praise to God because they, they do not set their mind on the things of the spirit. They set their minds on the things of the flesh, the things of this world, the temporal things of this life. That's what this is saying. So what we're going to do is just look at that in its context uh, in Romans chapter 8, which of course is... Uh, some have described it one of the greatest, if not the greatest, chapter in the whole of the Bible. It starts by saying, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, that's, a, that's, a, that's the statement that this is uh, referring to. Those who are in Christ Jesus, those who are born again. These ones do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For well, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So what they're saying is... Um, you know, we could, not, we could not offer to God a life that was pleasing to him and acceptable to him. But what we could not do, God did through sending his son. And his son fulfilled all righteousness. And that, that fulfillment of all righteousness has now been imputed to us because we're not in the flesh, we're in the spirit. It goes on to say then that those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. You see, we are, we are not at enmity with God. We're reconciled to God because Christ has fulfilled the law and has been well-pleasing to the Father and is, you know, has imputed his righteousness to us. So it goes on to say, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now that's true. Our body is unredeemed. Our body is death. It's, it's a mortal body. That's how Paul describes it. It's a body that is dying. You know, one day we will die. We are decaying. We get tired. We get weary. Sometimes we get sick. One day we will die because the body is death because of sin. Our body has not yet been redeemed. And it's in our body that we sin sometimes. 
sin dwells in the members of our body okay but our spirit is righteous because our spirit is joined to jesus and we are one with him as he is so are we we cannot sin john says we cannot sin not in our spirit we're already perfected we're complete in him and we're righteous now what about our body well if the spirit of him who raised jesus from the dead dwells in you he who raised christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you praise god one day our body will be raised from the dead one day our body will be uh, changed into the likeness of his glorious body no longer capable of sin no longer subjected to sickness or disease or death one day we will be totally redeemed and uh, we say hasten lord today but but thank god our spirit is perfected and uh, we are not currently money we set our mind on the things of god that's why we're here today we are spiritually minded people we want to know the lord we want to know his word we want a closer relationship with him we love his people and we love all the things that are connected to god and so just to clarify that and to clear it up uh, it doesn't mean that if ever we go through a stage or a moment where we, we, we're sort of worldly minded or we set our mind on the things of the world it doesn't mean that we've lost our salvation it doesn't mean that at all we know who we are we are the righteousness of god in christ and god has given to us eternal life we're going to be talking more about eternal security in this uh, uh, session this evening because uh, that's one of the questions that was asked okay now this question was asked by um one of our pastors in uh, zambia um hebrews is not understood by many christians pastors ask us questions from hebrews wherever we go and they do go they go all around that country planting schools of ministry there i think something like uh, 260 at least schools of ministry in zambia where people are being discipled in the gospel of grace but wherever they go and wherever we go you know if you talk about eternal security people will bring up the book of hebrews because there are i think it's five warning passages in the book of hebrews and some people believe that these warning passages are teaching us that we can lose our salvation now a major key to understanding sorry uh hebrews is the context in fact uh, a major key in understanding any part of the bible is the context so who was it written to and why was it written why was the book of hebrews written and who is it addressed to well it was written to a community of jews that shouldn't be surprising that's why it's called hebrews it was written to a community of jews who were making the transition from judaism into christianity okay that's why um, there's a lot of comparison between the old covenant and the new covenant between the sacrifices that represented and were shadows of the one sacrifice once for all that jesus offered uh, the tabernacle and the heavenly sanctuary the levitical priesthood and jesus our great high priest and so on and so on uh, some people will refer to it as the letter of the better what we have in christ is so much better than what was in judaism because they were just the types the shadows all pointing forward to jesus who is the fulfillment who is the substance uh, the reality of those things that were indicated in the types and the shadows and so these hebrews were being taught or educated sorry in that and so they were making the transition out of judaism into christianity but that was a huge transition uh you know it was a cultural change it was a uh, an absolute fundamental change in their whole lifestyle their culture their 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 family and and uh, their roots and everything was being challenged by this statement that jesus is the fulfillment of everything that was prefigured in judaism but they were making this transition it wasn't just a question of like putting their hand up and becoming a christian they were 
they were working on this transition, trying to understand it and move forward into it. Some had passed over, some had not yet. They had come so far, but then they kept looking back because as we're going to see in just a moment, there was also persecution. Christians at this stage, uh, around about AD 68, Christians were being persecuted. Jews were not. Some of the Christians were having all their possessions confiscated, everything taken off them. So people were thinking long and hard about whether they're going to make this transition into Christianity. Okay, So bear that in mind when you read the book of Hebrews. Now, the two main passages which cause people to believe that we can lose our salvation are in Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10. I'm sure that many of you will be familiar with these passages. Here's the one in uh, Hebrews chapter 6. It says, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and of the word of God, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Now, let's look at that carefully. See, some people say, this is saying, if you backslide, then you can't come back. <laughs> if you fall away, you cannot come back. Now, that's a very strong statement. If those who believe that, really believe that, then if they're ever sharing the gospel and somebody says, well, I used to follow Jesus, but I backslid, they would have to say to them, well, I'm sorry, you cannot come back. There's no way back to God for you. We should have a sign outside our ch churches, all welcome, except backsliders, you can go to hell. Because that's what people believe this is saying. It says, doesn't say it's hard or it's difficult. It says it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age of come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Now, there's a difference between those who were enlightened or those who are enlightened. That means they understand the gospel, their eyes have been opened, they're enlightened, and those who are regenerated, those who are born again. These were enlightened. These were the enlightened ones in that group They'd seen that Christ is the way. They'd heard the gospel very clearly. They'd even seen miracles, it says, you know, the powers of the age to come, demonstrations of the power of God in healing and miracles and so on. And yet, if they were to go back, it's impossible to be renewed to repentance since they crucify for themselves afresh the Son of God. They're basically saying, I've examined your Christianity. I've looked at it. And uh, not for me. It's not real. I, I believe that Je they're basically saying, I believe that Jesus was an imposter, that he's not the Messiah, that he should have been crucified. They crucify for themselves again the Son of God. Now, those verses are not saying that we can lose our salvation because in the same chapter, the writer to the Hebrews actually says the opposite. In fact, it's amazing. This is one of the most powerful verses that speak about our eternal security that you'll find anywhere in the Bible. And it's in the same chapter that people use to teach us that we can lose our salvation. Let's have a look at what it says. It's talking about the covenant that God made with Abraham. Remember, that's the covenant of promise, which we now believe is the covenant of grace. That in Christ, sorry, in Abraham's seed, that's Christ, all the families of the earth would be blessed with salvation or the nations will be blessed with the gift of righteousness. So when God made that promise to Abraham, it says this, God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, that's us, 
the immutability of his counsel, that means the unchangeableness of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things now, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So God, for our sakes, not for his sake, when he made this covenant, first of all, he gave his word, and it's impossible for God to lie. If God lied, he would cease to be God. He would cease to be who he is. He cannot lie. But for our sakes, he confirmed it by an oath. And if you look at that passage in Hebrews 6, it says that God kind of looked around to see who he could swear by. And he could swear by no one greater than himself. So he swore by himself. He basically said, may I cease to be God if I do not fulfill what I promised to do in this covenant, which is to be our savior and to impute to us his righteousness. So this is the most powerful statement. And it's in the same chapter that people use to try to discredit salvation and eternal security and to teach that we can lose our salvation. So the context is very important. Now, just moving on to that next passage, um, Hebrews chapter 10. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this passage. It says, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified or set apart a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, this is a, uh, a very sober and uh, serious passage with a strong warning. But let's look at what it says. It says, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, if this is teaching that we can lose our salvation, it means if you sin after you've been saved, there's no forgiveness. Now, some people really believe that. In fact, in the early centuries of the church, some people would not be baptized right up until the time they died because they did not want to sin and then render their salvation void or invalid. They thought that that's what would happen if they committed one sin. I remember sharing this in the Philippines and a pastor said to me, because you know he believed that you could lose your salvation. I said, um, and he quoted this, this passage to me and I said, well, do you sin? And he looked at me and he said, well, not willfully. <laughs> I said, come on. <laughs> When we sin, we do it because we want to. If I, if I lose my temper and get angry with someone, which is sinful, and say things I shouldn't say, I do it because I want to. I know it's wrong. Let's not pretend and be hypocrites here. But it's not talking about that sin. There's a specific sin, which is having been enlightened with the knowledge of Jesus, our salvation. If we sin willfully, which is to reject Christ, there's no more sacrifice because the Old Testament sacrifices were only a shadow pointing forward to Christ, the ultimate sacrifice. And when he came and died, then there was no more need for those Old Testament sacrifices. So there are no more sacrifices for sins under the Jewish system. Now, isn't it interesting that two years after this letter was written in AD 70, the Romans marched on Jerusalem, raised the city to the ground and destroyed the temple. And from that time, there has been no more sacrifice. You can only, the Jews can only offer up sacrifices on that spot in 
the city of Jerusalem. So for the last 2,000 years almost, there have been no more Jewish sacrifices offered. And there's no need for them because Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. He has fulfilled that sacrificial system. Amen. Okay. It goes on to say, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Okay. Um, which is a very wonderful thing in the mercy of God that he would not, you know, under the, 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 the civil uh, justice system in Israel, uh, one person's testimony was not good enough to condemn someone. There was, there was a need for two or three uh, witnesses. Now, it's the same under the new covenant. God has sent three testimonies, three witnesses, the Son of God, the blood of the covenant, and the Spirit of grace. Let's look at that again. Um, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled, first of all, the Son of God? God sent his Son to testify of the gospel. Who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood, the blood which he took into the holy place to bear testimony before God, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, just nothing, and insulted the spirit of grace. God has sent his Holy Spirit to bear witness of Jesus. There's the threefold witness and testimony. See, friends, we said last time, if I remember rightly, that there's only one sin that cannot be forgiven. And it's the most serious of sins, and it is to reject the gospel, to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. There is salvation in no other name but in the name of Jesus. Okay, let's move on then uh, to finish up here with this question. Also, in the same chapter here, chapter 10, the writer has already said, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So they're saying two things. Number one is that Jesus, through his sacrifice, has perfected us forever. And, and number two, there, there's no more need for sacrifices. You cannot, you know, the Jews could not go back to a system that offered forgiveness because that sacrificial system has now been fulfilled and completed. Okay. Uh, this is a very good in quest uh, question because I know that many people are um, sort of troubled by this. Uh, this person says, and he's with us today, I am in an environment where eternal security is strongly taught against. I personally would like to speak up, but I don't want to cause any confusion. What should I do? Should I speak up anyway? What a good question that is. Do you, do you speak up about it or do you just keep quiet? Okay, well, here's what I would say about that. First of all, don't preach eternal security as a point of contention. It, it's sad, really, to see that some grace preachers seem to want to get into arguments with people, into disputes and debates, and they go on social media and just raise issues for the point and the, the, the purpose of having an argument, basically. You know, this, this doctrine to me is too precious to start an argument over. Um, Jesus died so that we might be eternally secure and know that we're eternally secure. It's a precious thing. It's not uh, just an issue to debate over. But what I would say is we don't back away from it. Preach it in the natural course of your ministry. For example, you know, when I, when I discovered that God has saved me eternally, that I cannot lose my salvation because he's done it, not me. Um, I was in a Pentecostal church and I was alone in preaching this. In fact, I was regarded as being uh, not, a, not a heretic, but teaching something which was false and misleading and giving people the opportunity to sin and so on because it gives them a false sense of security. Uh, and yet I didn't get into arguments with people, but I preached it as it came up in my teaching in the Word of God. For example, if I was going through uh, a series in the book of Romans, then it's very clear there. 
eternal security is very clear. And so I preach it and teach it in the natural course of my ministry. The word of God will speak for itself. Um, I was known for one that preached this, and although most people in my environment opposed it. I remember preaching in a Bible school, not my own, when I was uh, a pastor in Christchurch. And uh, there were some students from Malaysia who were there. And this, this subject came up there and I taught it as, uh, you know, as I would. And when I went several years later to Malaysia, because they invited me to preach there, they said, oh, we remember you. you, you you're the one that taught eternal security. So I got a name for it. Uh, but that's okay. Preaching, now, the question was, if we just go back to the question, um, I don't want to cause any confusion. Should I, should I preach it? I don't want to cause confusion. Well, preaching eternal security will not cause confusion. It will clear up confusion. People who believe that somehow Jesus died to save us, but we can take that away from him. We can lose it by our behavior which is insulting to the blood of Jesus, is basically saying that our sin is greater than his blood. Our sin is greater than his grace. That's confusing. When you preach eternal security, you clear up that confusion. You don't cause it. But what it will do, possibly, probably, will be to invoke persecution. Truth has a habit of doing that. Truth attracts persecution. Usually, um, truth is on the side of the ones who are being persecuted. And so, you know, as this, probably this dear brother is experiencing, you will find that you'll be persecuted for that. Don't, don't, don't go into the arena to start a debate and take on everybody about this thing. That's not what God wants us to do, but teach it in the natural course of your ministry. Now, that person went on to ask this question. In your opinion, what would be the best way to approach the situation? That's a good question. Okay, my answer to that, my response to that is this. When you're under attack over this subject or any subject, learn from Jesus. You know, people will ask questions, try to trick question you. Ask your critic question. You remember they asked Jesus questions and, and he said, I'll ask you a question first. If you answer me, I'll answer you. The baptism of John, was it from God or was it from man? That put them in the corner because if they said it was from God, they would say, well, why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you get baptized? But if they say it was from man, they would really be uh, unpopular with the people because the people knew that John the Baptist was a prophet. So Jesus asked them a question and, and we should always ask, answer a question with a question. Okay. Now, here's two questions that I've never had anybody be able to answer me regarding this. Number one, when people say you can lose your, your salvation, I ask them, at what point does a person lose their salvation? Is it after one sin? Or is it after committing that sin 10 times? Or after committing that sin 100 times? Is it because they do not read their Bible for a month? Is it because they do not read their Bible for three months or a year? Is it because they do not go to church for a month or... At what point? What's the cutoff point? Where can you say to someone, now you have lost your salvation? Nobody has been able to answer that question because there is not an answer, obviously. And the second question is this. Let's suppose somebody can lose their salvation. Does that person then go back into Adam? Because the Bible says that as in Christ or as in Adam, many die, so in Christ many shall be made alive. Now we're either in Christ and we're alive, or we're in Adam and we die. We were in Adam. How did we come into Christ? We believed in Jesus, and the Bible says that we were baptized into him. It's an incredible thing. We were joined spiritually to him. We were baptized in him. We died to our previous identity in Adam. We were buried that's finished with. We've been raised a new creation. We are now people who are in Christ. Paul's most famous and favorite um, term for Christians. We are a people who are in Christ. Now, if we can lose our salvation, 
Does that mean we're baptized back into Adam? The grotesque thought is there's no hint of anything like that in the Bible, not a suggestion that we can go back into Adam. It's never mentioned or hinted at once. And so we need to, if, if, you want, if you're under attack, you need to answer the questions of your critics with critics. Always ask, ask them a question. Put them on the defensive. Okay. Um, then here's another thing I would say before we move on from this. When it comes to stating your case, always quote scriptures which make absolute statements. Absolute statements. For example, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Now some people say, oh yes, but if we... No, hang on a minute. You're, you're presenting a circumstance by which we can lose our salvation, but Jesus has just said, by no means. There, there is no situation or circumstance by which Jesus will cast us out. I will by no means. Whatever objection you bring or you care to bring, it's invalid because Jesus has said, no, that's okay. That's, that's disqualified. I will by no means cast them out. Here's another absolute statement. Paul said in that summary of his great teaching on salvation, which transformed my life and ministry, the first eight chapters of Romans, he said, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now that covers everything, surely. You know, some people might say, oh yes, but if we were to take a, no, I'm a created thing, and that's covered there as well. <laughs> I'm not able to overpower Jesus' salvation in me. Nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. What a wonderful thing that Jesus has done for us. Now, here's another thing uh, in closing, because it does appear that some verses seem to say you can lose your salvation. Some verses seem to say you cannot. So does the Bible contradict itself? No, it doesn't. Now, if it doesn't, we need to learn how to harmonize those verses that seem to contradict one another. The Bible harmonizes. It's in harmony with itself because it has one author, and that is God. And I thank God that, um, you know, I've learned to do that in these, in these areas. Probably two of the greatest areas is one, to look at those verses that seem to say you can lose your salvation in their context, like we've done with the, the, the verses from Hebrews. And the second thing, which is what we're going to do in just a moment, is to understand that some of those warning passages that seem to suggest you can lose your salvation are actually talking about losing our, our um, reward in the kingdom with Christ, which is not your salvation. They're two separate things. And uh, we'll come on to that now. Okay. Uh, this question was asked to me uh, recently. I, I did a, um, uh, a Zoom meeting in Indonesia, and one of the brethren there asked this question um, because he believed... Um, uh, you know, from, from what he was saying, that we're not just saved by faith alone. We need to uh, add our works to our faith in order to substantiate our salvation. And one of the proof texts that he brought to, to validate that was Matthew 7, 21 to 23. And it says in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus rejects those who believe themselves to be believers. So is it really enough that by believing in Jesus, we will be saved? So let me quote that passage to you. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Please note that. Shall enter the kingdom of heaven. We'll discuss that in a moment. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, doing the will of the Father in heaven is not the way to salvation. Believing in Jesus is the way to salvation. Amen. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. In other words, you did not do that in fellowship with me, abiding in the vine. You did that uh, according to your own agenda. You did that in your own power, in the power of the flesh. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now we'll look at these statements as we go through this. Now, it's important to know that this passage, of course, is in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The Sermon on the Mount is nothing to do with salvation. Jesus is not in the Sermon on the Mount explaining the way of salvation. The way of salvation is clear throughout the Gospels, Acts, and the Epistles. We are saved by grace through faith. Amen? The Gospels, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Jesus said, he that believes in him who sent me will not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. At the end of John's Gospel, he said, these things I've written to you that you may believe in the Son of God and that believing in him, you may have everlasting life. So it's very clear in the Gospels, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, you know, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then in the epistles, you know, many, many times we're told that we're justified by faith, we're saved by faith, uh, by grace you're saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So abundant testimony in Gospels, Acts and the epistles is the way of salvation is by faith in Jesus. Now the Sermon on the Mount is not for the unsaved. But for the disciples, if you look right at the beginning, the Bible says that Jesus went up to the mountain and the disciples came to, to him and he taught them. Now, a common belief, especially amongst grace teachers, is that the Sermon on the Mount isn't for Christians, it's for Jews. But it's not. It's for us. It's for the disciples. Uh, and one of the points that proves this is that there is no teaching in the Sermon on the Mount which is not also found in the New Testament epistles. Everything that Jesus taught, you'll find Paul and Peter and the others also taught. For example, did, did uh, Jesus teach us to be meek? So did Paul. Through the Spirit is meekness. Did Jesus teach us against um, covetousness, not to set our hearts on on uh, mammon? Yes, he did. Well, so did uh, Paul. In fact, Paul warned us against those who teach that, that our faith is a means of getting rich. Avoid those people, he said. Did Jesus teach us to love our enemies? Yes, he did in the Sermon on the Mount. So did the, uh, the apostles, Peter and, and also Paul taught that. Um, did Jesus teach us not to judge others? Yes, he did. And so did Peter and so did Paul and so did the others. And so whatever you find in the Sermon on the Mount, whatever instruction is repeated in the New Testament epistles. Why is that? Let's go on. What is promised throughout the Sermon on the Mount are rewards which will be given to the faithful during the coming kingdom of Christ on earth. So two things are prominent, the kingdom and the rewards which will be given there. Jesus talks about entering. Remember, he said, um, uh, let's go back there to that scripture. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus talks about entering before that through the narrow gate. Entering what? Very clear. He's talking not about heaven, but about the kingdom. Now, what is the kingdom? If you were with us last time, I explained that the word kingdom is from the Greek word basileia, which means the rule or the reign of Christ or God upon earth through Jesus for 1,000 years under the kingship of Jesus, what we call the millennial reign. Not every Christian will reign with Christ. That's the reality. Salvation is by faith. Reigning in the kingdom is by faithfulness. Two completely different things. I've shared about these things in other uh, teachings and uh, I know that some of you are familiar with that. It's a part of our course as well. Now, Jesus does indicate that there will be degrees of reward in the kingdom. By the way, 
we'll send you these notes and these slides uh, in the coming days as we did last time. So you don't need to uh, try to keep up with uh, jotting down the references. He indicates that there will be degrees of reward in the kingdom. He lists some of the things which will be rewarded in the kingdom. He exhorts us to lay up treasure for ourselves in the kingdom. He's not talking to the Jews, he's talking to his disciples. He reminds us that he is the source. This is important, friends. Otherwise, we get into a works mentality and, and uh, you get back into the flesh. He reminds us that he is the source of our fruitfulness. It is all by grace. Now, um, I've shared on the Sermon on the Mount, I think it's called uh, Living a Life of Significance. And um, it's very clear throughout that, that all these things, in fact, he starts the Sermon on the Mount by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit are those who say, Lord, I, I, can't, I can't do this. I can't live like this. You can't. I can't. He never said we could, but he can. He always said he would. And so the Christian life is is not trying to do something or to be something. It's letting him live his life through us. Um, it's you know it's by by faith that we see Christ living in us. We are we are branches in the vine. Let's just move on. False teachers will come to us at the crossroads. He said, "Beware of the false prophets. They constantly teach the broad way." One of the things I learned from my mentor in the early days of my grace walk, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he never, never met him personally, but uh, he changed my life through his writings. And he used to say this, false teachers, it's not just what they say, it's what they don't say. What they don't say. You'll find that false teachers will never preach on the themes that are mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount. They will never teach on the second half of the epistles of Paul, which are the exhortations and instructions of how to live according to the grace of God that's been given to us. They never teach what Jesus taught here. They use the Bible instead of, they use the Bible, sorry, they use the Bible instead of expanding it. They have huge gaps in their teaching. They call Jesus Lord, they prophesy, they teach us to use our faith to get things. Their teaching reduces the Christian life to a concern for temporal things. Now, this to me is a big thing. It may come up in our teaching in uh, future months. And I know that um, uh, some people in the grace community uh, do not appreciate me saying these things. But um, it's a fact and a reality that many grace Christians are focused on temporal things. All they preach about are to have their circumstances blessed, what they're living in, to be blessed in what they're going through, to be delivered from every kind of trial, uh, to be blessed financially, to be given success, to be given what they ask God for, to have answers to prayer. They're concerning temporal things. The Bible says, you know, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The great, I'm not, I'm not decrying these things. God does bless us in material things. Please don't get me wrong. But if that becomes our focus and we miss the greater things, which is the spiritual realities and especially our relationship with Jesus and what he wants to share with us and what he's doing in the earth in these days, then we miss out greatly. The cast out demons is possible to do mighty works and be nothing in the kingdom. Now the Bible says examine their fruit. Their fruit takes time to grow. So I don't believe this is examining their lives. I don't believe that. I think it's their teaching. They promise things and it takes time to see whether you're going to get the things they promise. They're, they're clouds that have no rain. They're empty clouds. They promise things, um, but they, they cannot deliver. And uh, this is a reality is that some of the things that they promise, they are not fulfilled and there's no explanation. They just keep promising. It's like dangling a carrot before people. You can have this, you can have this, you can have this. And so people keep flocking to their meetings to get these temporal things which often never eventuate, never materialize. Fruit takes time to grow. It takes time to realize that it doesn't work as they say it will. Now, that's I've, I've said some hard things there, and some of you may uh, need to go and pray about that and think about that and come back to me on that, and I'm, I'm open to 
discuss these things with you, but I think we need to really think long and hard about what we emphasize. And are we emphasizing what Jesus and the apostles emphasize? Okay, enough said on that. And the same person asked me this question. Okay, if, it's, um, if these verses refer to the kingdom and not losing our salvation, do we have to work out our own salvation to have reward in the kingdom? Okay, that's the question. Now, let's look at this verse, first of all, because this is often used uh, to promote, you know, faith plus works equals salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Okay, now let's look at that. Note this passage says that we have to work out our salvation, not work on it or work at it. Some Bible translations I've noticed as I've gone to other countries, uh, like Indonesia and Bahasa, um, it's not very clear, this passage. But if you look at the original, go to the original, the Bible says work out your salvation. Not work at it, not work on it, but work it out. And uh, we can only work out what he has worked in. So what, what, what Paul is saying here is God has worked something in you. Now bring that forth. How do you do that? By faith. By faith in Jesus. This is the key to the fruitfulness in the Christian life. We do not produce the fruit. He does. We are branches that bear the fruit. Let's go back to that scripture. Work out your own salvation with fear and trouble, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God is everything we need for life and godliness. God has worked it in us. We bring it forth by faith, by abiding in the vine and uh, believing that his life will flow through us. Now, I want to share from... Uh, um, Peter here, we quote Paul a lot, but I want to share from Peter who said the same thing. Because remember the original question is, do we have to work out our salvation in order to, to basically inherit the, the kingdom of God, to reign with Christ? He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So stop there for a moment. How is grace multiplied to us? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus. That's why we keep preaching Jesus. Lift up Jesus and uh, grace will be multiplied. People experience grace. You're lifting him up. He is, you know, grace came by Jesus Christ. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Okay, so everything you and I need to lead a godly life has already been given to us because it's a complete package. We receive Jesus. We don't get installments. We don't have to come out on order course to get more of God. We've received everything we need for life and godliness. How is it made possible? Through the knowledge of him who caught us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. You might experience the divine nature at work in you having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. Now look at this. It goes on to say, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Now that, in the original Greek, that means out of your faith, let this come forth. And then let this come forth. And let this, because you've received everything. So add to your faith, or out of your faith, let virtue come forth. From virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and are then, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at this. He who lacks these things, that is the carnal Christian, is short-sighted even to the blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sin. See, he's still cleansed, but he's forgotten that he was cleansed. He's forgotten what salvation is all about. He's sort of um, got you know, one foot in the world and one foot in, 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 in the Christian life. And, and he's just confused about who he is. 
Then he goes on to say, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For the, here's the point. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you see that? Getting back to the question, question, are these things important for us to work out our salvation in terms of us reigning with Christ, inheriting the reign of Christ and be, being with him in, in the age to come to reign over this earth? Now, yes, they are. Everyone will enter. There's a difference between entering Everyone, even, even people I believe who are alive at the second coming will be in the kingdom because the whole earth will be under Christ. Satan will be bound. There'll be one kingdom only under Jesus. Everyone will be in the kingdom. You and I will be in the kingdom. But those who are abiding in Christ and allowing his life to flow through them will receive an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. That means where they'll be rewarded with that privilege of reigning with Christ, even those words, well done, good and faithful servant, receiving the crown, receiving the throne to reign with Christ. It's a, it's a major thing and, uh, you know, it really does need more attention than is given by the church today. Okay, here's a question. Next question, we're getting there, slowly but surely. Nine questions altogether, we're, we're, we're getting there. Can we make a covenant with God? Now, there are basically two types of covenant in the Bible. The first one is where both parties make promises to each other. The Mosaic covenant was like that. Okay, so usually, in fact, the Mosaic covenant was based upon a similar system that the nations knew at that time. It's called a suzerain treaty. A greater power, say like a, a, a world power like Assyria, might make a covenant with Israel, a small nation. And they would say, okay, if you bring tribute, toll, custom to me every year, we will protect you from your enemies. We will not come down and plunder you. We will leave you in peace and we will protect you when you're attacked. Okay. Now, the, the old covenant was based on that kind of thing. God said, I will be your God. I'll protect you. I'll provide for you. I'll lead you and so on. As long as you do not worship other gods and you obey my word and you fulfill my commandments. Okay. So there were promises on both sides there. They said, all that the Lord has said, we will do it. They signed on the dotted line. But there's another kind of covenant where just one party makes the promises and the other party is the recipient of those promises. And the new covenant was like that. Uh, as I'm going to say to you in a moment, show me where you ever made a covenant with God. You never did. You are included in a covenant that was made. You made no promises to God. You made no vows to him. You did not take an oath to him. He made a covenant with you. It's, and it's illustrated in the covenant that he made with Abraham, the promised covenant. Because God told Abraham to wait and you know, make that avenue of blood and wait at the end. And he waited and waited and God did not show up until he fell asleep. And then God came and walked down that avenue of blood and made his covenant with Abraham while he was asleep. Abraham was not a partaker in the promises of that covenant. He was a recipient of the promises. Now, we are not encouraged to make vows to God. Some Christians do that. They say, Lord, if you do this, I promise I'll do this from now on. I'll serve you. I'll, I'll tithe, double tithe. I'll do this. <laughs> they make promises. And, and what they're trying to do is, is um, make deals with God. It's a law-based mentality like the, the Jews did, the, the Israelites. Lord, if you, if you look after us and do all these things, then we will keep your commandments and we will not follow other idols and so on, etc. Now, that's not the covenant we're in. And we're not encouraged to enter into any kind of covenant with God, uh, especially because if we enter in, then, then we are making vows. We are, we are dictating the terms, as it were. Lord, I'll do this for you and I'll, I'll, I'll serve you in this way if you will do this and answer this prayer. That's not, a, that's not what Christianity is about. We're warned against that. Even in the Old Covenant, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Do not let your mouth 
cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger, that is the angel of God, that it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many works, there is also vanity. Very clear. God says, don't, don't do that. Says, oh, if you do do it, you better make sure you pay it. But there's no need to do it. Proverbs 20, verse 25, it's a snare for a man to devote rashly something that's holy and afterwards to reconsider his vow. God takes our vows and our oaths very seriously. Now, in the new covenant, everything is given to us by grace on the basis of the finished work of Jesus. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all soul, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So it's a complete package. When Jesus did the greater by saving us from sin and giving us his righteousness and everlasting life, all things that we need are also freely, freely, freely given to us because of Jesus. It's all by grace. So don't enter into it. Don't be tempted to enter into a covenant with God. Now, moving on to that, we have never made a covenant with God. You can't show me anywhere in the Bible where it says we made a covenant with God. Jesus made a covenant with God. God made a covenant with Jesus. And because we are in Christ, we are the beneficiaries of that covenant. We receive all that Jesus purchased for us at the cross, the riches of his grace. That's why, you know, as I said earlier on, we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. This is what God said to Jesus from Isaiah 42 verse 6, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. That's us. And then in chapter 49, verse 8, Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I've heard you, and in the day of salvation I've helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. Well, if you look at those scriptures in your own time, you'll see that uh, these are prophetic scriptures talking about Jesus. God speaking, the Father speaking to the Son. So don't make a covenant with God. God has already made a covenant with Jesus. And because you are in Christ, you are one with him. You are complete in him and you inherit all the promises he says, all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. All the promises of God in him, in Christ, are yes and amen. Okay, here's another question, which I think is a good question. We, we might even have an occasion later on down the track to speak more about communion. But the question for now is, how important is it for us to take the bread and the cup as communion and how often? But the short answer is that it's very important, very important to take communion because it helps us to keep our main focus on the finished work of Christ. It brings us back to what is the foundation of our salvation. Jesus gave his life for us that we might be reconciled to the Father. He told us to do it often until he comes in remembrance of him. Now, you'll notice that churches that get away from sharing communion, breaking bread, uh, they get away from the centrality of the finished work of Jesus. They end up preaching a social gospel or a moral gospel, uh, but their, their focus is no longer on Jesus and what he did at the cross, the finality of the cross as the basis of our salvation. So it's important that we do this to, so that we remember what it is that brings us to God, the precious blood of Jesus. And we're to do it often. Um, it, it's not stipulated how often, so we don't get legalistic, we don't legislate. Let the Spirit guide you in this, but do it often. Do it often. At New Beginnings Christian Church, we do it every second week. Uh, we've chosen to do that. Um, but we, we you know, also don't just take the bread and the wine. We ask someone to share a word. And uh, one of my instructions to them when they do that is to make sure you keep the focus on the centrality of Jesus, the finished work of the cross. Don't just talk about what, you know, your latest revelation or something that's blessed you that's separate from that. 
we've come together around the table to focus on Jesus and what he did at the cross. Amen. Okay, coming into the last two questions. As the vaccine for COVID-19 is soon going to be mandatory, what is your point of view? Okay, there's lots of things that are circulating about this. Some people uh, are teaching that, um, you know, it's going to be mandatory uh, to take the, the vaccine once it's, um, once it's uh, available and that we'll need some kind of proof and that proof might even be to take a mark, a chip, uh, as identification. Now, these are all theories that are circulating. Um, so bear that in mind. Now, first of all, a vaccine has not yet been discovered for certain. Though the UK believe that they are close, but even, even if they are on the right track, they themselves have said it will be a long time before it's available because, as you know, these things have to be trialed. They can't just release them. They have to go through very stringent testing to make sure that it is safe for people to take. So it's not available yet, and it probably will be uh, sometime next year earliest if it is available. Second thing is I haven't heard anything about it being mandatory. It may be, but, I, you know, there's nothing at this stage because it's not available that says that you have to take it but many rumors are circulating. In the meantime, it's best to focus on facts. You know, we can spend a lot of time and energy speculating, but it's better to focus on the things that we know to be true and get on with what God has called us to do today. So I would not give much time or attention to that question, should we take it? Should we take it if it's mandatory? You can't, you can't buy or you can't sell unless you can prove that you've been vaccinated. You can't come into this store uh, until you've been vaccinated. Now, until that is fact, until that's written and legislated, it's best not to focus on that. We'll focus on that when we get there. You know, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has got enough things that we can focus on. There's faith for today. There's grace for today. Let's not go down the, the track one, two, three years in advance. What would we do in this kind of scenario? I don't think we're meant to do that in the kingdom of God. If it does become mandatory, personally, I do not believe this is the mark of the beast. We're coming on to this in the next question. Um, you see, the mark of the beast, first of all, where is the beast? <laughs> where is the beast? If people say that this vaccine or this chip is the mark of the beast, well, the, where is the beast to command it? It's got to come from a figure who we know to be the Antichrist. He has not yet appeared. He's not, you'll know him when he's here because first of all, before he issues this command and this chip or whatever it is, this mark, first of all, he commands that everyone worship him. You'll know him when he's here. It's not a question of, oh, is this it or is that it? Or maybe that person is the Antichrist. You will know him because... Um, personally, I think he will step onto this, the world stage at a time of uh, uh, global disaster and, and anarchy and unrest, and he will bring peace that no other person can bring, and then everyone will give their power to him, and he will command that they fall down and worship him, and then he will bring in a system like this that unifies those under his control. So we're a long way from that, and yet we, we might be sooner than what... We think, but we're not there yet. So um, I, I, I think it's probably uh, a bit of a uh, distraction, is the word I would use, to focus on things like this at this stage. Now, let's get on then to the last question, which does concern us very much, and it's this. According to Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, it says, so... Are we going to face the tribulation before we are caught up to the clouds, which is the rapture, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17? Now, um, let me just say this first of all, that you don't have to accept my view on this at all. Uh, you know, as much as I know, that many people 
have different views on the end times and how it would all work out. You know, pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture, and so on. Christians are divided about these things, and there are godly people in every camp. So please don't call someone a false teacher or reject them because they have a different view on the end times to you or I. That's very important to say. My view is that we will go through the tribulation. Though this is not to be confused with the day of God's wrath. What's the difference? The great tribulation is the trouble that is brought upon the world because of what man does to mankind. It's troubles that we have in the wars, rumors of wars, um, famines, uh, diseases, and all that sort of thing. These are things that are brought onto mankind because of man's inhumanity to man. The day of God's wrath is what God brings upon the earth by way of judgment. And that's after the day of grace. That's after the rapture. That's after the church is taken. Um, and that's the day of God's wrath. This is why we need, I believe, to teach both aspects of grace. If we are going to go through the tribulation, we need to teach people not only that grace is God's unmerited favor, which it is, praise God. And we need to keep on preaching it, never stop sharing it. It's all by grace. But it's also the empowerment for living. It's supernatural power to live in supernatural times, quite frankly. And I, and I, I am concerned, as I said earlier on, that some people are giving the impression that this message of grace is just to tell us that God is going to give us this and this and this and this and all these earthly, material, temporal blessings that he's going to deliver us from every kind of troublesome situation, every kind of trial that will never go through difficult times and that it's all going to be rosy. Now, that's bad teaching and that's not preparing the saints for life on planet Earth, let alone for the, the troublesome times that are lying ahead. Friends, we are living in incredible, incredible times uh, to think that the whole world, we never knew this right at the beginning of the year, the whole world is in this lockdown and we don't know how long for, we don't know what it's going to lead to, but it's just unprecedented. Is it a prelude to the, the tribulation that's coming? It could well be, friends. Let's face that. It could well be. The most important thing is, if it is, do we believe we are ready for it? Or do we think somehow we're going to just get a, a, a quick rapture out of it all and so we won't need to be prepared for it? Now, this is why I believe that we will go through the Great Tribulation. Uh, Revelation chapter 6. The book of Revelation, of course, is just that. It's a revelation of what is going to come in the end times. We know there are seven seals. Okay, let's quickly go through this. I believe that this is the Great Tribulation. The first seal is a rider on the white horse. That's the Antichrist who goes forth to conquer. And he brings a false peace. He's on a white horse, which speaks of peace. He comes in the midst of maybe this anarchy, this, which we're starting to see happen, this unrest, this protest, this, this vandalism, this uh, uh, rage against authority, the breakdown of law and order. And when that goes worldwide, people are going to say, what's happened to our world? How do we get here? Who can get us out of it? We can't do it through government. This man will be like a superman because he'll be empowered by Satan. He'll go forth to conquer the nations through a false sense of peace. Secondly, the second seal will be unloosed and the, the red horse takes this peace from the earth, resulting in war. Thirdly, there'll be the rider of the black horse, which brings famine, which always follows uh, wars of this sort of nature. Uh, and then the fourth seal is a rider on a pale horse, which brings death. One quarter of the earth's population will die. So these are, this is the great tribulation. That's why... You know, Jesus said that there's never been times like this before, nor ever will be again. These are horrendous times which lie ahead. Are we still here? I believe we are. There's no mention of the rapture at this stage. The next verse, verse uh, 9 to 11, the fifth seal, says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw upon, under the altar the souls of those 
who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. These are the martyrs that are put to death under the Antichrist system. They cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, till you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a right, white robe was given to each of them. So they're now with the Lord. They, they were put to death, and with the Lord, a white robe was given to them. And it was said to them they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was complete. They should rest a little while longer. So they're still not yet redeemed. They're, sorry, they're still not resurrected because the rapture has not yet taken place. Then we come to the sixth seal, which is the pivot point, the turning point, the, the last thing between the great tribulation and the day of God's wrath. It says, I looked when he opened the sixth seal and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became like blood and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the nevers. And they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And look at this, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Now that question there, who is able to stand? These things are coming to the earth. Who is able to stand? In the next chapter, the answer to that question, who is able to stand, is given. There are two groups who will be able to stand. The first is the Jews, because they would have been sealed. Okay, God is now turning his focus to the Jews, because the saints are now raptured. The saints are able to stand because they are now raptured. In fact, that's what it says in these verses. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, and peoples, and tongues, standing. Who is able to stand? These are standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne of God and worshipped God saying, Amen. Blessing and honour and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones, look at this, who came out of the great tribulation. You, you cannot come out of something unless you've been in it, friends. The, the saints, the raptured church has come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serving day and night in his temple. And he who dwells on the throne shall dwell amongst them. So he who sits on the throne shall dwell amongst them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. They have their resurrected bodies. The sun shall not strike them nor, nor any heat for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So that's the reason why I believe we will go through the tribulation. Um, after that, the seventh seal is open which is the day of God's wrath. We will not be here for that because we, we, we do not come under the wrath of God because Jesus endured the wrath of God for us. So we will not come into that judgment. Now, whether I'm true or not, whether I'm correct or not, I should say, um, my point really is this in, in responding to this question. There are difficult times ahead and we should teach our people that the grace of God, which not only reconciles us to God and forever makes us his unconditionally knowing that we'll never come into condemnation. That same grace empowers us to stand in the midst of a wicked generation, an evil 
generation and to stand firm and to stand true and faithful to Jesus and to be a witness to him unto the end. And so I encourage you, those of you that are teaching the grace of God, to teach it in that aspect as well. Well, you've been very good. Um, I think um, uh, we'll, we'll open up the... Um, those of you, if you can, unmute yourself. You, you're free to do that. Uh, unmute yourself. And uh, uh, thank you so much for being attentive. I noticed that there are some questions. We'll, we'll try to go through those. Uh, let me just have a look at so what we've got here, whether they're related to uh, what we've been sharing. Um, uh, my question is on the Holy Communion. How can Christians prepare well under grace before partaking? Uh, maybe I should just uh, mute you all again. <laughs> can you mute yourself if, you, if you're able to do that? And I'll, I'll, I'll mute you in just a moment. Okay. Um, how can a Christian prepare well under grace before partaking of Holy Communion? The question is specifically for people who are married, because I've heard that a week before partaking Holy Communion, uh, because I've heard that a week before partaking Holy Communion, married people should not meet sexually. Am, am I ignorant on this one? Yes, you are. <laughs> that is an extra biblical teaching. Uh, there is nothing wrong with a married couple engaging sexually at any time. Of course, at home, not, not, not in public. Uh, so you do not have to separate from your partner um, before taking communion. You are qualified because of Jesus. That's the whole point of communion is that as we hold that cup of wine in our hands, we remind ourselves that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from every sin. And we are now righteous before God. So really, that is a wrong teaching. I don't know where that's come from, but it's a man-made doctrine. And uh, I encourage you um, to correct that in your environment. Um, absolute statement. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. As we got saved by faith in Jesus, can one lose their salvation by not believing anymore? That's a good question. Um, my, my answer to that would be, if, if you believe in Jesus, you will believe with him to the end. That's my, that's my understanding of that scripture. Um, those that do turn away, it's the, the, they were professors. Um, in other words, they, they gave a mental assent to salvation and Jesus on the cross, but never put their trust. There's a difference between putting your trust in Jesus. That's the aspect of faith that the Bible really talks about, is trusting that Jesus is your savior when you've done that personally i believe that no one will ever go back on that they may go back on other things they may have doubts they may have uh, uh you know moments of um, walking carnally and worldly and so on but they will never go back on their faith in the lord jesus christ as their savior that's my belief on that one we may be able to look at that one in a little bit more depth uh if you if you want to share some scriptures next time we can do that what are the benefits then of reigning in the kingdom since all believers make it to heaven? Okay, so the, the, the reigning in the kingdom is the 1,000 years before the eternal realm, okay, before the new heavens and the new earth, because eventually even this earth will be destroyed and, and there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. And so before that, Jesus will reign on earth. Now, my belief is this, that Jesus must reign on this earth. Otherwise, God has been robbed of his purpose. He put us here to reign on this earth so that all of creation would see the glory of God manifest through the people of God. Okay? Now, if that doesn't happen, if Jesus doesn't come and reign for a thousand years on this earth, we will never see this earth as God originally intended it. But God is not much. God is not, uh, his purposes are not taken from him that's why satan will be bound and and you know it will be an incredible thing i'm just so looking forward to that moment when jesus christ is king of kings and lord of lords on this earth every knee shall bow every tongue confess he is lord to the glory of god the father and that's what we call the glorification of jesus and the amazing things dear friend is that jesus said i want to include you in that I want to include you in that. I want you to reign with me. When he went back 
to heaven, he brought many sons to glory. And if we're sons, we're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with God. Why is that? Because God entrusted this earth to us originally. And he said, have dominion. And we lost it. We, we've never experienced the dominion, the reigning on this earth as God intended us to when he created us. But Jesus will restore that to us fully. And, you know, the Bible says, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. I, th I think this earth shows much of the glory of God now. I'm, I marvel at the beauty and the majesty and the, the goodness of God that we see in creation. But how much more when Jesus is reigning, when sin is no more, when Satan is bound, and all the earth is coming up to worship Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Wow, that would be tremendous. Okay. Uh, okay, um, what is the name of my mentor? My mentor... Um, was Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Now, when I say mentor, I mean through his books. Um, uh, he changed my life, especially his series in the Book of Romans, his commentary. He's got about I don't know, like nine or ten commentaries on the first um, half of the Book of Romans, and it absolutely changed my life, my ministry, set me on the right course. And, and I thank God for that man. He helped a lot of people discover what the gospel really is all about. He's a typical British preacher, very laborious, very uh, uh, long-winded, but my goodness me, very sound and uh, very scriptural. Um, and how are we to take bread and cup in order to avoid it just being a religious ceremony, please? Some say it is a meal eaten together while speaking about the things Jesus did for us. Um, I, I just wonder whether that deserves a little bit more time that we might put into the next session. I think, I think we might spend a bit more time in the next Q and A session and look a bit more deeply because there are there are different views that are coming out now about communion, what it is and what it isn't, and I think some of them are going a little bit beyond what the scripture says and, and therefore getting away from what the scripture does say. So if if it's okay with you, I think we might save that one. Uh, we'll say if you can send that one to me for next time, we will look at that there. Will the church be in the earth while the Antichrist is reigning? Yes, I believe that we will see the beginning of that time. That's, that's what we call the Great Tribulation. That's my belief. Don't excommunicate me if you don't agree with it. I think um, it's one of those things we've got liberty to agree to differ on. Uh, oh, he goes on to say, never mind, you are answering this question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's wonderful teaching. Praise God. Explanation on the Great Tribulation is clear. Thank you, Rosanna. Um, according to Romans 8.29, does God already plan and know <laughs> who is going to be saved or not? Now, I did, I did address this last time. Do you remember? I, who, I don't know who's asking that question, but what I would do is encourage you to watch the YouTube of the last Q&A because I said you need to look at salvation from heaven's perspective which is romans 8 29 and 30 and earth's perspective or human perspective which is romans 10 i forget the exact verses but you'll find that there we need to understand both and acknowledge both and teach both even if we don't fully understand both so i would i would encourage you to do that because i go into it in much more detail thank you uh, thanks, Pastor, uh, for the answer. Just a comment on the answer. I've understood now. Man-made doctrines are hard to be clarified in the Word of God, and most of them not found in the Apostles' Doctrine. Amen to that. Now, if some of you remember that I, I have a, um, a two-fold approach to every doctrine that you hear, every new doctrine, every wind of doctrine that comes through the body of Christ. Simply ask these two questions. Number one, did the apostles teach that, preach that in the Acts of the Apostles? Uh, the Acts of the Apostles, did they practice that? Acts of the Apostles, first 30 years of church history. Do you find, for example, the apostles um, telling disciples that they are to abstain from sexual uh, relationships with their partner for a week before communion? No, you don't. So therefore, it's a man-made doctrine. Did they teach that in all the epistles? No, they didn't. You won't find it anywhere. 
So those two questions, is it in the book of Acts, practice? Is it taught in the epistles? If you don't find, if it comes up no both times, you're looking at a man-made doctrine. Okay. I think we've answered all the questions. How about that? How about we unmute you? If you can unmute yourself, please do so. And feel free to greet one another, to um, um, even to write greetings on the chat if you um, are able to do that. I'm, I'm able to unmute some of you, but the rest you have to do.